Szanowni Państwo, witam ponownie i, i Site in the Polish society, the Polish state under communist regime. This panel will be moderated by Professor Marcin Kroszyński from the Institute of National Remembrance and the uh, Aviation Academy in Derby. Uh, professor, could you please present the uh, panelists? Uh, over to Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, let me let me welcome you to this conference. Can you hear me well now? Some technical problems. We'll... No, it's not possible to hear uh, you, sir. So, sound is pretty uh, poor quality. There was a moment we could have heard Professor, but uh, unfortunately, now it's better. Now it's much better. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I would like to thank uh, the, um, Director uh, Wierzbicki, Professor uh, Wierzbicki, for um, letting me moderate this panel. I would like to welcome all the uh, guests of this, uh, of this uh, conference, uh, the countryside against communism and the 20th century. So we are talking about Polish situation now, um, 1944 until 1980. So we are going to discuss the cultural and social aspects. We have uh, ex uh, outstanding experts dealing with the broadly understood uh, topic of the countryside, uh, dealing with the cultural and social aspects of uh, the um, discussed topics. So I would like to welcome uh, Professor Leszczyńska from Warsaw, uh, Sylvia Selmarsza, from Wrocław and uh, the main participants to the discussion, Professor Jarosz from Warsaw and uh, uh, City of Lublin, represented by Dr. Osiński. Ladies and gentlemen, as I already said, we are going to uh, enter now the social space in, uh, in Poland, 1944-1980s. Uh, uh, a bit about politics, but more about the uh, cultural and social aspects. That's what we are going to discuss. This is my uh, personal, actually, area of interest. But we cannot actually abstract from uh, politics completely. So I prepared like three thematic blogs or three sets of broadly understood questions and I would like to ask you to provide your answers. Each of you will have five, six minutes uh, um, so uh, time in case of uh, webinar is also limited so we have to follow certain rules. So each of you will get five or six minutes to answer my questions and we will move on to the uh, consecutive thematic blocks and at the end we will uh, go for a summary, conclusions and uh, perhaps we will have time for discussion with the uh, ladies and gentlemen i want you to feel free in this relation and uh, in case you actually would like to uh, comment or ask question on ongoing basis please um, um go for it do so uh, feel free um, of course as i said we have a limited time so um, it's not the first time that we meet uh, various discussions. I will actually try to, to guide uh, to court the time. So let me start with the political aspects of the political sphere. So the level of acceptance of the social and economic changes among the rural population after 1944 up till up un until 1989. So when I read actually uh, Mm. Professors, historians, they um, often mention the adaptation. Um, 
the system. Um, I would like, however, to take a broader perspective. So the level of acceptance, acceptance for the social and the economic changes were there more or less actually accepted in the areas where rural population have these changed over time. Uh, whether the acceptance for the social and political changes was also the acceptance for the system. Um, just to uh, summarize this question with the easiest section question, what was the level of uh, impact of uh, communist uh, PZ PR party. What was uh, the impact of uh, USSR? So, how will this actually uh, function in the rural areas, in the countryside? So, acceptance. What was accepted? What was not acceptance, uh, accepted? Uh, so, over to you, uh, dear guests. And uh, first, I would like to give floor to Professor Jarosz. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. I was thinking about uh, this complex. Uh, topic or the whole range of uh, topics, issues that you've mentioned, and uh, just briefly, five minutes, not more. I don't want actually to speak to that. So the level of acceptance for social and political changes, uh, social, of course, economic, uh, political, social, and economic changes, because uh, political, uh, social changes go with the economic ones. So two aspects that were not accepted in the countryside. Collectivization idea and uh, the creation of the uh, state-owned farm holdings. And, uh, this, uh, I'm talking about collectivization and some other ideas that uh, were raised uh, during the Gomulkas and the Gerex times. Mm, to socialize the rural population. So uh, the countryside was actually quite critical vis-a-vis uh, -vis these ideas and uh, quite reluctant. And of course, the second aspect is fight against the Catholic Church. So traditionally, the Polish countryside uh, uh, consists of Catholics and uh, the ideas to fight against the Catholic Church were really actually, were definitely not welcome. So basically, the support for the Catholic Church was uh, relatively large. That can be visible when we actually nastawione w dużej części na taką chłopską religijność. So basically, uh, the uh, peasants were fighting and protecting their uh, religious nature. So uh, when it comes to acceptance, um, I believe that uh, acceptance, well, there was acceptance actually for development of various types of the agrar infrastructure and acceptance for certain educational ideas. And um, I was already discussing this uh, an hour ago. Uh, when we follow actually statistics of the social deeds, uh, what actually uh, peasants actually uh, get involved. So they get involved in construction of the roads because they know if they don't build roads themselves, nobody will build them for the uh, for them and actually they also in, they also commit to the construction of the schools. So support for uh, support for the parties, uh, ZSL and ZPR, the support is not high. However, in terms of uh, ZSL, uh, ZSL uh, the support is a bit more stable. According to data from, eight, from 1980s, uh, the uh, share of peasants in ZPR is approximately 310,000 and in uh, ZSL 350,000. So this is the share of peasants uh, in these two parties, more or less uh, the uh, headcount is the same. So um, every tenth actually uh, person in the rural population was uh, a member of a party. So this is actually the, uh, that was the ratio. In the 80s, actually, the number of actually members in ZSL decreased from 349,000 to 330,000 in uh, 1989. In uh, PZPR, after the wave of actually um, the present support, uh, uh, for 1987-1989, uh, uh, in this appear, we had uh, more or less 100, uh, 300,000 actually. 
uh, President's uh, member, fellow party members, uh, uh, there are so the drop of this membership uh, uh, mainly related to PZPR, uh, mainly actually this drop related to the farmers and small uh, farms holders. So those actually who so far were the supporters of the uh, political party. So there are more and more presence actually or uh, farmers who um, or actually bigger farm holder, farm holding owners actually, the uh, majority of them interestingly enough stayed in the party as party members. So that is a, a certain paradox. We don't know why uh, it happened, however. So that's uh, uh, all when it comes to this main areas, so actually now I'd be happy to listen to my colleagues. And Dr. Straszek, I fully agree with Professor Jarosz, and I take a similar, actually, position vis a -vis the uh, factors that you've mentioned already. Uh, when it comes to this uh, large uh, farm holders, actually, maybe it was related to ZSL, because ZSL was actually supposed to be represented representation of the individual farmers. Um, actually, collectivization was fighting against them since 1950s, called them actually kulaks, and uh, they actually made this division between this uh, small um, farm uh, uh, small holders and uh, medium, mid-sized holders, actually. Individual farmers, to a certain extent, were somehow uh, closer to uh, their uh, parties at the cell. So I would, say, I would take this perspective. Myself, I'm dealing with actually um, with uh, the topic of the state-owned farm holds. Uh, during the um, what happened with this uh, state-owned farm holds uh, as of 1993-1994? These are quite interesting aspects what happened with this uh, farms later on. But coming back to the uh, actually to the topic of collectivization, I was actually uh, researching the Silesian region until 1956. Uh, I uh, made a publication actually I uh, about this, and uh, it may even actually accentuate uh, um, the certain aspects in Silesia. I can tell you how, how, what happened here. It's a very specific, very special region when it comes to certain adaptation of the, to the conditions that appeared here, uh, adaptation to, to collectivization, uh, probably, and that was the biggest uh, share of the production uh, co Operatives, uh, they actually appeared here in this region. So uh, since 1945, uh, people were not actually that closely linked to the um, ownership of land. In Silesia, there were actually recovered uh, territories, and we there were many uh, newcomers actually coming to these lands. So they were not related to uh, farming, so to agriculture, and they were actually hoping for a certain um, incentives given by the party. So I agree with that these social deeds in the times of collectivization, even, you know, uh, creation of uh, uh, preschools and crashes at the cooperatives that were actually to uh, encourage peasants to join the, uh, the cooperatives. A very strong position of the Catholic Church and actually a very specific role of the church in the uh, Lower Silesia. So a different role to this uh, so-called old uh, uh, regions. So there are minorities that appeared here. So it's a huge ethnic uh, mosaic uh, that often uh, tend to lose uh, certain typical trends, trends that actually appeared in other regions of Poland. However, I believe that peasants mainly complain about these years, the spirit of collectivization, even though in this region there were many cooperatives, uh, but they got dissolved in 1956 quite quickly, uh, instantly, even those who were actually quite 
quite effective and uh, they ceased actually the operations even however even until now we have certain cooperatives maybe not the typical ones that they were created by collectivization but we have some other actually um, co cooperatives like uh, the fruit and vegetable growers they are until now existing however they claim that this is a totally different type of cooperative they follow the free market rules and these cooperatives definitely are totally different to the ones from the 1950s and uh, the period that we can find the period of this uh, or as farmers actually um, perceived the best uh, the most positive way these were 1970s 80s were more difficult definitely however support from the party was there and uh, actually i also found a lot of uh, people who did not uh, leave the party instantly. So these are my remarks insofar as what was happening, especially in Lower Silesia, because this is what I'm dealing with. Uh, however, well, church was not as important because I found uh, in the documents information that uh, the priests were calling that the authorities want to put them in chains, uh, uh, give them some kind of labels on 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 um, like like uh, like cattle wares uh, to wear bells, uh, but there were also villages in which the church served that the creation of such a cooperative is going to be related with a lot of new people, newcomers uh, at the countryside. So this uh, was creating a, a more modernized, well, maybe not modernized, but more modern village. We'll be talking about modernization today. So I think this is it uh, insofar as authorities. Before I give the floor to Professor Cecilia Leszczyn, because uh, both speakers mentioned that so the engagement or involvement of peasants into those social actions, uh, uh, like building a, a preschool or school or anything, it was not related to the, to the party, it was about the improvement of their life. Style. Yes, in my opinion, yes, for the comfort of life, various types of things were established, roads were built, schools were built, because it was making uh, life uh, just uh, more comfortable. Well, villages are quite peculiar, quite special. Children are left at home. Uh, well, they help at the, in the farm at the farm, but they go to school, but very often there were no schools. What was peculiar here is that uh, these were big, huge estates of villages that didn't have schools, didn't have this entire uh, uh, resource. Role, tak? Te wszelkiego rodzaju świetlice, dożynki organizowane i też zawsze coś, jak na zasadzie hasła budujmy, prawda, bo to dla naszych... Such slogans as "Let's build it," because this is for our good. There is uh, acceptance, but there is big resistance. Although Lower Silesia, well, there are a lot of those cooperatives. Uh, the, the smallest number of protests, but there are a lot of people who had to go to jail for many years, or people who were without land, or, or the land was taken away from them, or they were given. A worse quality uh, plots, but I believe that the social action resulted from the need of the local inhabitants who didn't have that, and because of the fact that authorities were helping uh, a little bit, they were taking advantage of it. I'm going to give the floor to Professor Jarosz because we were reading those party materials. And uh, the authorities were complaining how much uh, people ignore those party uh, actions. So sticking with the party 
Being the distributor of the goods of the properties, Professor, one sentence about these uh, social acts. Yes, I agree with Madam. Doctor. Yes, peasants uh, think in the categories of their local interest, and they were not really interested in getting rid of the party organization very often. Well, we, we talk about the party people, not communists, because after the war we talked communists, because this was the pre-war tradition, but afterwards they talk about the party people. And they were their own party people. Thanks to the participation or the membership in the party, they were able to take care of something for the local uh, community. And this was this very pragmatic approach that worked uh, very often. So, in my opinion, you were right. So, pragmatism as, as usual. Madame Leszczyńska, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? We are comment on the themes that you have tackled, and I wanted to also to introduce new elements. So the theme presented by Professor Jarosz. So uh, peasants uh, as the stronghold of Catholicism, of church. This is what we are talking about. This attitude is present in the 50s and in the 60s, of course. We are speaking here, on one hand, about uh, quite widespread uh, campaigns of putting up crosses that uh, the people's authorities uh, are fighting, but people keep doing that and they keep uh, putting them up under the cover of night so that the people who participate in that remain anonymous. So this is uh, one thing, this is a manifestation, the demonstration of uh, the people from rural areas. It's difficult to research this uh, on the scale of the entire country. It's uh, diversified depending on the region. The second thing is the millennium and uh, Cardinal Wyszyński uh, and the uh, people's Catholicism building around it, uh, around the painting. So the stronghold of Catholicism as a very important power or force for this power of the church, this is, um, there are no doubts about it. The second thing that you've mentioned are the social acts. Of course, they do appear, yeah, like schools, 1,000 schools for 1,000 years, but later in the 70s, especially in in the 80s, there's less of that, but in the 70s, this is the construction of clubhouses. Uh, we have also the sports team, people's sports team that do various campaigns in one word. The access of uh, rural population to these undertakings. I have an impression that when we read some papers, it's a mass phenomenon. I would say that this is uh, going back to the community because these various holidays or the harvests uh, organized that Sylvia mentioned, they do create again out of those villages that have uh, had very difficult history, uh, they bring them back to the community. So the scope uh, within the act is present. Maybe I would wonder about the reason, what is the approach to the party, to the system, to the local situation, this all is quite significant. So how much the local secretaries, because let's remember that every municipality has uh, their own secretary and they they are esteemed or approved and and how much they are perceived as enemies by local communities so here quite important are the local relations they can be varied it depends on on the local community and the relationship between the village and the party secretaries for the first instance to which we go with a complaint if something is not going well. Thinking about this right now, ad hoc, about this accession
discussion to be some of the takings uh, related to social acts, I wonder how much they fit to a certain rural practice of a common undertaking, like uh, repairing roads or other buildings. They did exist in the history of villages. This is why it's not perceived as something completely new. All the collectivization was a phenomenon completely new, negated, etc. Some joint undertaking were present. Let's remember that self-help or helping each other, however we define it, was uh, working in the fields was used uh, in before the war. We have peasant strikes also as an expression of a certain community of interest of social community in the villages. So this is about the themes that we've spoken about. But if you're talking about the approach of the villages of the people from the countryside to the representatives of the regime, I think that we might agree that with the general information factors, indicators and numbers, we should accentuate the diversification of regions. Polish countryside is not homogenous. We have huge differences, and Sylvia mentioned that a little bit, talking about the lower Silesia, or western uh, and, and northern parts of Poland, where the structures, village structures are stable. Therefore, the relationship between the authorities and local community, local rural community, will be marked with greater tension, especially in difficult periods. The second issue that should be mentioned is the approach to the new regime and uh, the representatives uh, of that regime, the approach of various uh, rural communities. Speaking about this, I'm using uh, my intuition that also one of research. We know that uh, rural community is quite diversified. We get this antagonism painted by the authorities, symbolically represented by the kulak on one hand, on the other hand, the poor guy. The poor guy is a uh, farming worker. Or smallholder, and uh, uh, I can't answer the question how various groups of the rural community were uh, reacting to the activities of the authority. Of course, there is some research confirming my intuition that the approach will be rather positive from the side of the poor uh, uh, groups, uh, and uh, maybe more reserved. Uh, uh, from the big or medium size uh, uh, farms. So, so more, let's say, opportunistic, conformistic. So, so the other issue that I wanted to tackle when we are talking about the general approach to the authorities the problem, I would say, of the acceptance, maybe not acceptance, but relating to the oppressiveness of the authorities. We know that they have equality on their flags, uh, equalizing the status, etc. Out of various uh, sociological research, we know that rural communities was characterized to a certain degree. So at the top of hierarchy, historically we had gentry, landowners, but after uh, the wall, we have the most, uh, the richest farmers. And in the 50s, they are the victim of the authorities, but the beneficiaries are 
uh, poorer people. And what I mean here, that this policy of powers, uh, hating the historical structures and hierarchy will impact the approach to the new system and to the policy, because this policy is changing in time. So here we should also add the evolution of the regime. So where did this intuition come from? We know that in the 90s, after the change of the system, there's the recreation or maybe creation from scratch of Kyrkis uh, in the rural environment uh, in, uh, in, in bigger and smaller farms, so conservative and, uh, and community, and the Kyrkis was reborn. In one word, it seems to me that this liquidation or the attempt of the liquidation of this Kyrkis in the People's Republic could uh, influence the uh, approach to the new system and the policy of the party. I don't know what you think about it, but I'm um, uh, looking at the, this so a certain categorization actually uh, got back and gained new impetus and uh, basically there were newly created uh, certain tensions there was actually uh, well, moving away from the uh, egalitarian structure uh, created uh, earlier Madam Professor, do you know, can you tell us anything about this uh, last issue? Do we know anything about actually the uh, how the rural population uh, how the rural population actually approached the topic of the round table and this transformation after 1989? So this approach, this attitude would change over time. And of the uh, 1980s, actually, uh, reforms implemented by Rakowski and Wilczek. Uh, from the perspective of the countryside, uh, at least in the first period, actually, uh, gave a range of benefits to the rural, rural population. So there is a huge uh, size market, actually, basically created. The food goes to the um, open market. Uh, now it goes directly to some smaller markets, etc. And um, in a moment when the problem of liquidity and profitability of the um, agricultural production, and that was beginning of the 90s, and the situation actually started to deteriorate. As we know, Balcerowicz reforms, uh, uh, the realistic price of credits, uh, so the uh, economy uh, falling into the trap of uh, debt, uh, but on, on the other hand, openness towards import, and this openness towards import uh, means that the farmers have to, for the first time ever actually, face the uh, foreign competition, and this uh, impacts the income. That's why the rural population is more critical about the reforms and transformation until the moment of strikes, etc., and uh, demonstrations against. Uh, so this situation, this relation, this attitude uh, uh, was evolving, and uh, over time, uh, quite quickly, it became definitely critical. May I add uh, something here as for the transformation and the attitudes of the rural population? I think it's important which area we are talking about when it comes to the um, state on farm holdings, they PGRs, they were left alone and basically you know, nobody wanted to go for transformation and changes because majority of these farms would be uh, of course um, dissolved. So the whole generation is working in these state-owned farms uh, used to the fact that uh, they get everything from the state. Uh, so basically changes uh, brought them to a difficult situation. They were they had difficulties to cope with uh, certain uh, state-owned farms. Uh, PGRs have been dissolved, um, so closed down. As the whole actually village is ruined as an outcome of it. No training, no help, no 
unrealistic support. So the whole villages were left alone, abandoned, uh, destroyed uh, monuments, uh, beautiful symbols of culture. It was not simply about the farmers that actually uh, got into troubles, but this whole intangible uh, properties were left uh, behind with no interest from the state. So let me add additional question. Maybe any of you would tell me what was the share actually of support uh, when we joined the European Union uh, in the rural population. What was the percentage of uh, the uh, rural population supporting our accession to the European Union? I don't remember the exact numbers, but there was a huge movement actually trying to convince uh, farmers that it's profitable. The subsidies for farmers, of course, uh, that uh, came here along with the accession. But I don't want actually to be too smart because uh, I was not analyzing actually all these topics, so we would have to go for the statistics from referendum to see what the support was. And uh, mm, but it's been already many years later. Let me draw attention to the fact that the situation was really dynamic. So the uh, farmers' solidarity in the 90s, when the um, so, uh, commun communist regime was actually contested, uh, the farmers actually demand the stability of the uh, farming sector participation in actually setting the goals, uh, political freedom, etc., etc. So there were like four groups of the uh, political postulates. But I have the impression that the uh, communities uh, or the uh, members of this uh, state-owned farm holds in the whole debate on the transformation was not were not present. Uh, they were simply absent there. They uh, appear in this actual uh, situation. But when the reforms have been uh, developed. By the way, let me add that uh, there will be an interesting book published by the uh, uh, Vinsh uh, Editing House, our colleagues from the Warsaw School of Economics, uh, interview Balcerowicz and some other uh, people assisting his reforms. And uh, they say actually that uh, these uh, state-owned farm, farm holdings, actually, this is a set of people that do not have voice, actually. This uh, is not a set of people. It's not actually perceived as a set of people people, nobody thought about these people uh, there. Uh, everybody, probably the state thought well, they would have to cope somehow. So let me refer now to my research. At the university some years ago, we had ongoing discussion on the awareness, awareness of the workers, uh, farmers, and uh, some other actually um, groups of blue colors, whether they were aware what the transformation was all about. And our colleague uh, worked and organized actually the uh, preparing some analysis and reports, developing these materials, actually, uh, he said that people were not aware of that. And I have the feeling that uh, the farmers also were not fully aware of what the transformation was about. They knew the benefits, but they were not actually seeing the potential risks. So they didn't know what the market was about. Was about. Uh, the uh, actually farmers uh, in the, under communist regime uh, did not face the market. Actually, all production was sold. And here, all of a sudden, there is something new coming into play. Uh, all of a sudden, actually, um, it turned out that uh, production is not uh, needed anymore. And this was a new experience, experience that was that uh, the farmers were not aware of, actually, at the end of the 80s. Maybe Professor Jarosz would like to add uh, something here. Uh, sorry uh, for uh, asking you directly. I just wanted to uh, confirm uh, what I have said, the information actually that comes from certain discussions uh, um interviews with people who worked on that reform. So, Professor, one sentence. No, I don't know the topic. Let's uh, give floor to Mr. Osiński. Uh, Dr. Tomasz Osiński, uh, level of the acceptance of, acceptance of changes. Were there any actually changes less or more accepted? Uh, was it actually equal to the support for the communist regime? Over to Mr. Osiński. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to focus on uh, certain aspects. 
uh, certain actually areas, uh, and I will uh, I will try to address the uh, topics that have not been that broadly addressed so far. Uh, first and foremost, let me refer to uh, something that was mentioned by Professor Leszczyńska uh, about the hierarchy. Of course, I fully agree with uh, the existence of uh, the fact of the existence of this hierarchy. However, let me draw uh, your attention to the fact that it was even more uh, specific and these internal hierarchies in individual groups uh, were there. Not all the um, workers actually of uh, these farms were uh, equally interested in uh, the agrar reforms. Uh, they, of course, played various roles in these farms uh, in, 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 and their status in the holdings was all different as well. Status in terms of profession or uh, in terms of uh, um, work delivered. There were, of course, generations uh, of uh, experts who, in this hierarchy of farm holdings, uh, uh, had ever uh, in, enjoyed high positions. And no agrar reform. Uh, that was actually a strong, actually, um, accent for the uh, countryside. It was supposed to create uh, the countryside from scratch. It introduced certain um, worries. I examined this topic in Lubuskie region, but I've had, uh, I found some information that the victims of this actually, of this whole model actually, were the peasants themselves, actually those who, at a certain moment, uh, appeared to be among this group of um, uh, farms uh, to be divided. So there are some documents that uh, demonstrate how these people, uh, through their social belonging, denying that they are not uh, belonging to the gentry, that they do not have this lifestyle, etc., etc. So that's one thing. And second, uh, um, well, actually, during the Second World War, I believe, by the way, uh, here we also see an interesting uh, uh, impact of the occupation times on the uh, rural relations, but I'm not going to uh, talk much about it. Uh, however, I have the feeling that the uh, occupation period potentially impacted the um, lowering, actually, level of antagonisms between the gentry and the um, and the, and the uh, peasantry. Uh, before the war and during the occupation time, uh, there were certain transactions that took place, uh, land transactions. I know certain cases cases where examples may, may be not uh, well, statistically insignificant, but also not uh, unique cases where these uh, uh, farms were divided according to certain pre-war data. So it turned out that people well, that actually uh, land users, certain land users would lose their land. So the land uh, or agra reform sparked a lot, of a lot of disturbances in the countryside, which is quite an interesting topic. I am so sorry. This is the signal of my uh, the home well, actually, it's not, I, I cannot actually stop it. So this reform triggered a lot of actually tensions in the countryside. And of course, uh, well, the separate topic is the uh, attitude of the peasants to the gentry that was already mentioned in the previous part a panel uh, by uh, Professor Jarosz. So um, let me just say the following. Indeed, there was a certain mechanism in which the uh, land ownership was a lost case. And many people responded to the whole action in a positive way because propaganda used certain tricks. 
osłabić. To, próbowano na przykład uh, weaken certain moral dilemmas. Chłopnie jest stroną tutaj. W tej, uh, Propaganda was trying to convince that the peasants are not actually the party to the uh, whole deal and uh, to this whole reform. Chłopnie jest stroną Mahami. Profesor Kruszyński, nie wiem, czy czas mi się kończy. I I see Professor Kruszyński waving. Aha. No, 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 I'm waving pro, to Professor Wrona, who joined us. Uh, so um, it was, as I said, actually, propaganda was trying to convince that uh, peasants are not the party to the whole operation. They just received land from the state, uh, not even mentioning the question of costs for uh, the beneficiaries uh, uh, for the acceptance approval of uh, this uh, land. So, um, Ladies and gentlemen, moim zdaniem jeszcze, jeszcze istotne. What else was important here? Wielokrotnie już o tym mówiono. On many occasions it was already mentioned the, uh, this kind of uh, collectivization betrayal. Uh, so uh, in the press actually there are many articles uh, saying in the in the 1940s that the collectivization will not happen. So those who believed in that uh, or those who actually became the owners of the uh, farm holdings uh, that were supposed to be the uh, foundation for the agro system, uh, all of a sudden became uh, completely uh, disappointed by the state or they really actually uh, experienced uh, a certain type of betrayal. So I think from the whole situation, actually, you, we can try to outline the attitude towards the political uh, activist. There is a difference between the political activist who is a member of the local uh, community and the foreign for uh, political activists. So this political activist uh, appeared during the collectivization and during the agrar reform period. So, of course, there is a uh, topic referring to the uh, assessment or evaluation of such political activists. Uh, Professor Jarosz mentioned that they were uh, able to organize uh, certain benefits, uh, advantages for the villagers and villagers, uh, but please bear in mind that these activists were perceived, uh, and this the whole um, action is actually perceived as a path for uh, abuse and actually method of abuse. So uh, in the media yeah, we can read a lot about actually how poor the activists were, how much they abused the system, etc., etc. So already back then, actually, uh, specifically in the 40s and in the 90s, uh, there were many uh, publications about it. So I believe that in this first period, the agro reform and then actually collectivization that was a big failure for the countryside, um, all this actually uh, created a certain attitude of the rural population towards the authorities and uh, towards uh, the politics. Uh, I have uh, undertaken an attempt to uh, research to analyze uh, materials uh, from the times of the rural reform, agrarian reform, so from 1945 to 1989. These are my just initial conclusions, really, about that, but it seems to me that this anniversary, at the moment where the collectivization starts, doesn't disappear. It becomes, so we could say this subject which is a bit shameful for the authorities. Uh, it appears in a stronger way in later years, but what is interesting, precisely, Decidedly, insofar as the number of materials, amount of materials, or this uh, ceremonial ambience, the anniversary of uh, rural reform is covered by the people's holidays, so the uh, state uh, harvest, which is happening more or less at the same time. So. Therefore, my conclusion that this is a subject for 
A difficult subject for the authorities. If I may, another second, I would like to call attention to the fact that in this uh, rural community, on the People's Republic, we have two main categories individual farmers and uh, family uh, support and uh, employees of the state sector, their lifestyle and the perception of various things in a sense is a bit different. And the party activists who function in the state sector of agriculture, they play a completely different role. What comes to mind immediately is uh, the state uh, land property. This is the year 1947, when a manager of a unit, of a staff unit, is a person who is appointed by the party and is fulfilling uh, the party instructions. So the supervision of the party over these organizations, this, the structure of state agriculture is very, very uh, big. And the last remarks about the party activity in the countryside and this reflection is confirmed in a way in different parts of Poland. I reviewed a little bit of materials about uh, production companies in Lubelskie province. These are documents that are difficult to read uh, besides the fact that there are lists of people who participate in meetings. There is no information information about what was the subject of the meeting and what was happening at the meeting. So, actually, and Evelina Spak writes about it as well, about this low commitment, low level of commitment insofar as party activity. And this is all that I wanted to share in this part. Well, before we continue, I would like to ask you about one thing, because I was intrigued about one thing that you've mentioned. Speaking about the agrarian reform, uh, as a result of everything that was happening in 1944, you said you don't want to say more, but could you? The cost for beneficiaries, but what you're speaking about, are these economic costs or cultural costs? But didn't the peasant feel uh, that uh, they participate in 1944 in theft? When I read Richard Pipes and World Communism and the things that were happening in 1917, for a long time, peasants didn't want to take the land for cultural reasons because uh, the land belonged to the boyars, so they believe that this is theft. So was there such a cultural mechanism in Poland in 1944? Again, again to realities. The area where the reform is done in 1944 and the territories where it's done in 1945. In 1944, we are dealing with a certain surprise insofar as the apparatus which is supposed to carry out the reform, there are the famous uh, reprimands uh, coming from Moscow uh, that uh, finish with uh, arrests starting in October. The situation is quite weird. It's rather weird because there were various things happening in those estates. Some of them are abandoned by the owners. Others, owners stay and they stay until they will be able to pass it down to adequate proper institutions. And it seems to me that there is this uh, basic difference that in these, uh, in the territories, uh, on the other side of the Vistula, from the point of view of Lubelskie province, certain strategies 
were already prepared. So I've heard these stories, and for sure you can find it in uh, literature, in diaries, memoirs, that there were contacts of the representatives of the villages with the owner, for example, owners from Wielkopolska, Greater Poland, who were returning to these areas uh, uh, following the front line that was shifting. And the conclusion of these meetings was as follows, that if the locals will not take the land, then there will be others here yeah, from neighboring uh, villages or neighboring estates or some other areas uh, of Poland. So I think that various uh, moral dilemmas did exist. Uh, to a big degree, this was dependent on local conditions, uh, relationships between the owners uh, and landowners and the um, villagers. So there were various situations that would happen. Uh, I also heard about uh, the fact that uh, the owner was not present because he was uh, in military service, was uh, uh, actually accused of collaboration with the Germans, so uh, his property was divided uh, among the people. So the range of, of uh, behaviors, of attitudes is quite broad, from very positive ones to towards uh, the landowners uh, up until, let's say, strongly negative. So, for now, it's difficult to uh, describe it in general terms in so far as what it looked like all over Poland. What we have at our disposal are just some remnants of, partial research, so it's very difficult for me to speak about it uh, because the attitudes were varied. And I give the floor to Professor Cecilia Leszczyńska, and before we move to the next subject, uh, uh, I would like to add one more thing. Uh, uh, what about the Catholic Church? Did the Catholic Church mentally, physically impact the acceptance or non-acceptance of uh, the reform? Madame Leszczyńska, continuing this theme, the problem of uh, uh, ethics of participating in the rural reform, I think that uh, the sensibility was weakened, uh, just like you've mentioned that this is theft, like in Russia after the revolution. Well, the situation in Russia is quite different because this is 40 years after appropriation, expropriation in Poland. There is the entire um, project of the agrarian reform and there is a payment. And this is happening, uh, this reform is happening in the spirit, uh, let's remember, of uh, so solving the uh, problem of overpopulation that the ministers and the interwar ministers were mentioning. Of course, it was supposed to uh, be connected to some compensation, but uh, this exists in the political discourse throughout the entire interwar period. Let's remember that during the war, the people's parties also are in favor of the reform. It's supposed to have a different character character, but it's supposed to happen. There is yet another element that is quite significant. This is why uh, for, for, for this participation uh, in this division of land, namely, there is some symbolic compensation. Let's remember that it's not that these people receive this uh, land as their property. They don't get uh, uh, the deed. It takes for a long time. This is like an equivalent of a Jew, and payments for this land will be happening. It's not going to have a pocket dimension that these payments or compensations for the uh, uh, land received will be happening. And we're talking about this reform, of course, it's going to look different in Western lands, because in case of Poland, we have, well, actually, there were three zones, three areas, because uh, it's 
it's quite different in Western and Northern lands. Yes, so at every analysis, one has to mention that diversity uh, depending on the region. The estates, even if they exist, but there are not many of them. It's not a gigantic area that would allow to divide. I would like to pay everyone's attention to the aspects accompanying the reform that, uh, that show that, all right, participating in that, we are not doing anything horrible, that this is uh, not uh, some kind of coup, because this, there is a political problem and there is the symbolic compensation. Afterwards, let's remember, that under People's Republic, nobody was contesting the reform. Okay, in the 90s, it, uh, it uh, reappears. I don't want to talk about it now, but the agrarian reform was considered uh, to be something proper, uh, apart from... Of course, it didn't solve the problem of overpopulation. Ja jeszcze ja akurat tutaj one more thing that I wanted to mention one more sentence because uh, the fear um, of uh, uh, withdrawal of the reform appears in 1956 there are very stories happening there is a very interesting story from Lubelskie uh, right after leaving prison in Zamoyskie ordinance, the, the last ordinate, Jan Zamoyski spends vacation, and we have this uh, account, uh, uh, live account uh, in quotation marks from the stay, how the party uh, dignitaries react, and various, various stories described uh, in a party press. But this is not the only case, because there were many cases of the disturbances and uh, uh, calming the rural population. I found several such accounts, uh, press accounts that were speaking about it, that there was, uh, that because of political changes, there was a certain fear appearing in the countryside. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as, as much as we can hear, no matter how much the rural population in the countryside actually experienced the political life, on top of that, there was a different separate life. We've heard that uh, politics is politics, but constructing the uh, school or preschool, this is a question of the pragmatic approach towards uh, daily life. So now, uh, let's move uh, away from the politics and how much politics actually and there's uh, the uh, sphere of the private life. So how was actually, uh, how was it actually in 1944 to 1989, talking, thinking about uh, progress, mentality, religion, education, daily life, was it all about modernization? I will put the question mark here because I would like to hear from you, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think about it? Uh, how much ideology, how much much actually uh, propaganda, how much uh, pragmatism and progress. So let me use the uh, certain uh, stereotype, the clash, uh, mm, the beginning of uh, the 90s, the movie called Konopielka. I have the impression that this movie is not only a criticism of certain backwardness, it's also uh, uh, just, you know, that the movie is ridiculing the progress. So uh, what was proposed by communism, and communistic uh, regime, uh, was it really, uh, wasn't it really too artificial, surpassing the whole uh, period, actually? So that's why the... Uh, that's why countryside... Uh, uh, followed certain changes in the area of mentality. They did not want to follow this uh, uh, progress in the area of uh, religion, for instance. 
Uh, there was a notion uh, called uh, static culture when uh, we talk about the rural population. Maybe communism uh, too quickly was trying, or artificially, was trying actually to de, de root actually the rural population from the static culture. culture. So how was uh, this daily life uh, like actually? Was it the progress in terms of uh, mentality, education, religion, um, health, elementary daily life, or maybe some other areas that uh, come across your mind? So let's give floor to Professor Jarosz first. Well, you proposed a uh, sur certain complex uh, problem to be discussed within such a short period of time, five minutes. Professor. Eight minutes then. Okay, I will not bargain anymore. So let's start with uh, the uh, notion of modernization. There is a huge uh, discussion about the modernization, what it was all about, how this happened in the Soviet bloc and how it happened actually in the other parts of the world. So we may say that modernization in this classical aspect actually was a developed theory of the social change. Uh, it was understood as a, a certain shift from backwardness, traditionalism towards towards the um, modernity. All these nations would require further analysis and explanation. I will stop here. I will not actually um, dwell on that because we have no time for that. This theory uh, was actually appearing in the 50s, in the 60s. Actually, we were talking about postmodernist. This neo-modernistic theories uh, actually uh, returned by the end of the 20th century. So what type of modernization was represented by Poland or Poland? Polish uh, countryside uh, uh, during uh, the uh, Polish uh, Republic times, actually. So that was the initiative uh, modernization, as we can call it. Uh, the Bolsheviks was, of course, uh, following the um, uh, certain type of modernization project, and they decided actually to implement modernization in this extremely political, politicized way. We, however, at Adopted a certain type of modernization. We were forced actually to adopt that model of the imitative Soviet uh, modernization, and that's how we became uh, the imitators of the imitators. So basically, it was the imitation of the imitation. Mm. So, of course, certain aspects related to this project of modernization were actually should be mentioned. I would like to discuss some of them. Because if we decide, if we decide that something that happened in Poland was actually imitation modernization, uh, so something what you described actually uh, is a certain model of, uh, of uh, modernization, whether it's the true modernization that's a different uh, topic. So one of the progress that, uh, types of the progress that happened was the actually technological progress. I will not repeat uh, discussion from the previous panel, but this technological progress in the Polish countryside, that was actually at least until 1970s, that was a social progress. We actually called the development of uh, uh, agriculture, we uh, actually the um, collectivization with anything else, it's just a progress uh, in, within its social pro, uh, framework. So that's uh, how it was presented in the uh, propaganda materials and scientific uh, so, uh, papers. So mechanization, let's leave it here. Uh, let's uh, actually discuss the topic of education. Progress in the area of education, progress in education, uh, was it significant? Yes, it was significant indeed. Uh, the uh, analysis, uh, educational research that was actually carried out, talking about the selection the educational system, which was, by the way, a serious problem uh, uh, with a big disadvantage of the uh, peasant's children. So the selection understood as a percentage of actually uh, uh, School, primary school kids vis-a-vis -vis the number of actually students at the universities coming from rural areas, that was really actually with a big disadvantage for the rural population. On the other hand, however, 
w wyniku tego awansu oświatowego dotarła do poziomu studiów. When we try to uh, so realize actually how many of these peasants kids uh, uh, joined the universities, it turned out that in the beginning it was 24%, whereas actually by the end of the system it was only 7%. So something must have happened uh, that you know young people in the countryside uh, did not uh, undertake their studies. They, due to some reasons, did not actually undertake the tertiary education. And uh, it, actually, it was not resulting from the fact that the educational system was not actually open to this uh, population. It was more open than actually in the uh, beginning of the 20s. Um, that was a different pro problem. That was a different issue. Uh, so the changes, uh, um, or actually, due uh, to uh, some changes uh, in the society, uh, studies became more, um, let's say, open to uh, and the young, uh, young people coming from the countryside didn't want actually to go to universities. Why this, uh, this uh, did it happen? That should be actually a topic of a broader reflection. So studies for these actually peasants, uh, youth was not uh, profitable at all. And that's why actually there are less and less people, young people from the countryside undertaking tertiary education. Another problem related to collectivization of the countryside, uh, namely the social insurance system. The fact that this social insurance system was changing over time, the fact that it was uh, becoming more and more uh, accessible for the rural population, that's one thing. But there is yet another aspect, actually a change of a paradigm of uh, uh, perception of the countryside. So, what I mean here? In the 1960s, there was a certain uh, social insurance system. However, uh, this uh, social insurance system was mainly about actually, for instance, uh, giving uh, land away to the state, only if the state uh, um, wanted to take land, to accept land. In the 1967, there was a new insurance act for farmers, and this legal act said that the uh, farmer was allowed actually to give land to the um, state or to the successor. What does this who the successor is, actually. So the communist regime actually uh, started all of a sudden actually to fall apart in this specific uh, detailed uh, provision. So, of course, uh, in the 1983, when the constitution was changed, actually, um, the constitution stated then that the state is obliged to protect uh, the land, uh, private uh, uh, land and private uh, farm holds. But back then, and actually this paradigm was actually destroyed uh, due to some ideological reasons. So this type of modernization, this change of modernization actually was quite typical. This dynamics of modernization was quite typical back then. So in this uh, modernization, in the next modernization panel, we were uh, supposed actually to talk about the mentality. We mentioned this already, uh, mainly topic, uh, mainly to discussing the question of religion. So, um, the existing uh, research clearly uh, state that actually declarations of actually uh, um, belonging to certain religion uh, dropped uh, in the country as well. So in 1987, 75% uh, of the rural population, uh, of the uh, urban population uh, declared uh, actually belonging to the uh, Catholic religion and 94% uh, actually of the rural population. So when we followed this declaration level actually since 1960s, actually they were dropping over time, but uh, all of a sudden actually the uh, Polish Pope was elected and this declaration um, level uh, gained its impetus again. There is yet another aspect. There is attitude towards uh, the state vis-a-vis -vis the attitude towards social actually um, demonstrations. So there is a certain, there are certain service actually um, 
analyzing support for the uh, social demonstrations by the uh, rural population. So peasants, when it comes actually uh, to the support for the um, uh, such demonstration, so peasants were less reluctant to support, uh, less willing actually to support such demonstrations uh, um, as uh, compared uh, with the other social groups. So that was another typical model. So it's also worth discussing how much modernization impacted the typical for the 1970s uh, um, certain uh, theory that said that Poles can be divided in those who want to have and those who want to be. So the peasants definitely wanted to have mainly, so to possess. So that's very important to understand the uh, mentality, peasants, the peasant mentality and the uh, mentality of the Polish city specifically when we talk about the Polish uh, city, uh, citizens actually, who come from the countryside. So that's all about these uh, basic elements of the modernization in terms of mentality, religion and education and the daily life. So I believe these are the most important element, uh, just like a bullet point actually worth discussing and I'd be happy actually to hear your opinion on that. Just one sentence. Uh, um, question actually related to education. I, uh, I, I studied it a bit actually in the 40s. The uh, um, ethos of intelligentsia was actually uh, a positive and attractive for the uh, peasant and actually it was related to the status of quality of life. So um, intelligentsia actually presented certain standards in the 30s. The rural population, of course, uh, perceived educated people who had actually big uh, uh, manor house and uh, servants, yes. And in the 50s then, uh, later, uh, there was a discrepancy between the level of education and the uh, level of stand and standard of life. With one exception, however, I was trying to recognize it, but uh, it, my life would not be sufficient actually to discuss this topic, to analyze it. So the certain exception from the rule is actually uh, the exception of uh, schools for engineers and uh, technical uh, universities, so the, or technical uh, uh, secondary schools. So the rural population would be more interested in these schools than in universities. Mm -hmm. Um, over to Sylvia Strasza. When it comes to the social aspects, uh, Professor already actually mentioned and discussed the most important aspects. These are broad and deep topics, and indeed the analysis actually is, uh, quite, was quite sufficient. So we have exhausted the topic. Uh, let me also draw your attention to the topic of the agrar modernization. So was it really modernization, or was it just a seeming modernization? Make, make up modernization, fake modernization. So what is also very interesting, because Professor I was uh, not, well, I was not at the panel where we discussed this uh, technological fall of the agriculture and what was happening in the 60s and 70s, because if we're talking about about the modernization, it seems to me that it would be worth it to compare ourselves to those who are better than us, where farming was on a higher level and one tractor was able to work more land and was more efficient. And also uh, the population with double jobs. Uh, we can move that to our third subject, I think, because really when we have this very strong pressure of industrialization of the country, in the 50s and later, the cost of uh, not underinvested agriculture this is a problem, especially for family farms. And maybe the issue that at the beginning, really, the population, especially the family farms, were trying to send their children to the universities. And later in the 80s, there was a drop in that. And I think it was related also to the fact that these children very often 
didn't find employment on adequate positions in the city, so they would return to the countryside. They would lose because this was a loss of time. They were losing a few years when they could have started a family and help at the farm and make money, yes, make money, uh, develop this economy and benefit from it. They were studying. So from the point of view of a rural family, and I've encountered that in many documents and memoirs, that this was just a waste of money. This solution, which also appears here as uh, this uh, population that had two jobs, which was the product of industrialization and desurbanization, because cities are developing, this was also very convenient for the party or for the authorities because of the costs of uh, durable migrations where we had to build new dwelling buildings, create the whole infrastructure for people escaping the villages because the majority was uh, living below a certain border. This expenditure, however, uh, well, it was much more effective are valuable to build various transportation channels or special buses that would come to the villages, villages that were near big industrial centers, urban centers, and take the people from the countryside, which would uh, form this uh, population with two professions. They could sustain themselves from uh, working in the countryside, but also there was this co-financing from working in the city. So I think that the third panel would be more fit for this uh, type of population, but I think it would be worth it to concentrate on how this, uh, first of all, this modernization looked like of the agriculture from the point of view as I think of technology, how much land per tractor. In so far as Poland, compared to socialist countries, we stood out because we had quite a significant number of the tractors. Also, after the liquidation of a cooperative, there was an auction or sometimes uh, uh, they, they were just simply passing it down to individual farmers or you could rent it. There was this cooperation, but these were mainly uh, old machines. Like in Lower Silesia, these are machines after 1945. They were never used because people who appeared here didn't know what to do with it. So the issue of modernization, I'm also observing in Lower Silesia such a clash with the new type of management that there are people who had the experience, had the culture, of using land, benefiting from this entire uh, technical support that did exist here, but the majority did not. So looking at the results uh, up to the 80s, uh, at Poland, from the point of view of number of hectares and uh, arable, arable land per tractor, in Spain, for instance, per one tractor in 1950, there was uh, 1,239 hectares of arable land. In 1982, only 37. So, how, what, what the development Development it is. So this is the process of modernization. However, insofar as Poland, the situation didn't uh, change that much. There was no radical change. There, it was bad because earlier there were even 500, but afterwards about 60, 60 some per one, but it was old equipment. Uh, outdated equipment. So in 1984, per one combined machine, there was 182 hectares, but in developed countries, it was several times less. In France, it was 52 hectares. 
<laughs> with our 128 hectares in Germany, Western Germany 29, in Austria 26, in the Netherlands 35. So these disproportions were huge. So what did it result from? We really had a very good technical support and the use of fertilizers, but this was not effective because the majority of these resources were used ineffectively. So the process of modernization shows how highly ineffective it was when the majority of the resources uh, went to the socialized farming. So one fourth of our farming, uh, neglecting over 70% of family farms that received only uh, tiny amounts of fertilizers or the possibility to use different types of equipment. So I think that from this point of view, it's difficult to talk uh, about the fact that the uh, village, the countryside was modernized the number of buildings that were created or the way that they looked. Uh, I did an analysis of buildings that were built in the 60s in Lower Silesia countryside and the buildings that were created in the 30s when uh, the Lower Silesia belonged to the Reich. So this is incomparable. These uh, buildings survived till today, the majority of them, of course, those that were not at the front line and were not destroyed, but really this culture, our culture, building, uh, modernizing, and taking care for for, 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 for the entire infrastructure uh, of uh, agriculture, I, I don't think that we can talk about any special modernization. But if we are talking about uh, uh, social aspects, uh, about taking over certain trend tendencies, what was happening all over Eastern Bloc, everything has changed the way that uh, apartments uh, uh, were um, designed. Uh, right now we have a return to to the 70s. There is the fascination with the People's Republic. So for the young people who are appearing now who uh, appreciate or notice it, this is uh, a phenomenon in a way that uh, uh, this uh, the, the, the way that the apartments look, the clothes, everything that was typical to the People's Republic was quite special, quite peculiar. Killer, and they are able to differentiate. They can say, okay, this is the way that the interior design is done according to PRL, so the People's Republic. I don't know if you do that when you watch a film or a TV series from the 80s. All apartments look almost the same. So we adopted a very similar culture. So there was no market, no free market. Well, there was no market for such products. So everyone was uh, buying almost, uh, almost the same. So if anything appeared, everyone was happy that they were able to uh, bring something to their family home. But uh, these are very interesting. And the issue of this modernization, I think that from the point of view of economy or, or agriculture, it's difficult to talk about modernization. But uh, from the perspective of all these factors that Professor mentioned, they are very interesting. And a lot of things have changed comparing the uh, interwar period uh, and the year 1945 in mentality, but we are still dealing, uh, uh, tackling this mentality and uh, uh, the changes that were happening under the Polish People's Republic with people's mentality, right? Because this is unfortunately still in some organization very clearly visible and available. I think that the paradox is for the founding founders of the Polish uh, Republic, uh, well, you've talked about furniture, and I was also puzzled by this thing that among uh, furniture, which is selling the best, besides the supermarkets, people buy furniture from the 60s, uh, made according to this design. Yeah, this is very popular trend right now. Yeah, this is uh, furniture, which is very trendy, a bit off, but very trendy. So the modernization with a question mark, uh, the, I was trying to ask this question all right now. I have uh, in my work a book about the kitchen or cuisine in Polish People's Republic, and she is uh, 
the, the author is writing that uh, that the menu is changing, that the awareness is changing about what is healthy, what's not. So it's something changing. I was also reading and reviewing something about uh, music uh, on the Polish People's Republic. So what did people in the countryside listen to? What what uh, what kind of groups? What kind of bands? Uh, like folklore bands, etc. Thank you. I would like to disagree slightly with uh, Madam Doctor because uh, in so far as modernization, modernization is a process. This is happening to a different uh, degree. There is a modernization, there is a regression from various points of view or various aspects should be taken into consideration. When we speak about that modernization. I would like to stop for a moment at that technological modernization, not for long, of course, because we already discussed it in the first part. And here, of course, the situation is like an interwar Poland. On one hand, we have islands of modernity, but on the other, there are some old fashioned technologies uh, insofar as various machines, rural machines, or crafts machines. During the Polish People's Republic, still in the 70s, in the literature, I have encountered information saying that in some regions, there is uh, this uh, old-fashioned piece of equipment uh, used. Uh, we don't know what was the uh, motivation of using triple cropping or sequential cropping, uh, but we have the professionalization of farms in the 70s. The farms that produce, contract, sell, they also enter international markets. I mean, here, especially garden production, but also uh, uh, the raising of broilers, of chickens. Yeah, and this is happening. This is starting. This is modern uh, farming using mechanized uh, uh, force. So here, when we move around these big aggregates, uh, saying did it modernize or not we have to say it depends uh, depends when i think that the agriculture of the 60 is a peasant's agriculture everything is being done we don't have any risks uh, that uh, we are Mm. specializing in one type of production and i think that uh, the 70s with triple cropping in some regions uh, bring uh, about uh, this uh, agriculture modernized this is the well, the constitution is not guaranteeing anything the authorities want to, to socialize everything, but the credit process, investment process, new buildings, this is starting. The 80s will stop it before of the crisis, uh, but I would like to mention here that this modernization to a certain degree is, well, I don't know if it's blooming, but there is a scope of it which is happening. I don't want to throw from statistics because because they confirm it or exemplify it. I would like to mention that we've talked about the tractors. The tractor is a symbol, uh, the symbol of modernizing agriculture with uh, uh, social control, of course, with women driving tractors, etc. Probably you remember that there was a professor saying that there is a horse uh, versus a tractor. So horse is, is a symbol of traditional farming, but 
the tractor has, has been a symbol of the changes. Here's another statistic I adopted in 1960. As many as 90% of uh, labor force, of, of the force or of the power, yeah, engine power in agriculture, 86%, almost 90%, it was life force. So um, uh, there were no more oxen, but there were horses. In the 80s, in the entire agriculture 25 percent is the life force 70 percent is mechanical force mechanical engines in the 90s we have only 10 percent of life force 90 percent 10 percent is mechanical force so tractors it looks similarly in private farms although we know about the state policy insofar as generating this in the public sector in the 80s it's starting to change only in 1968 the state allows farmers to purchase uh, the dry uh, tractors uh, used tractors it's about actually buying tractors from the public sector and uh, there was a certain transfer happening of course these tra tra uh, tractors are quite poor the powers horsepower is very poor limited only at the end of 70s and uh, these are actually the strong uh, machines that would actually pull other equipment. So the technological change starts with tractor when it comes actually to harvesting and all the work related to the land. So I would draw attention to that fact here. So. Uh, in some farms, a specialization happened and relatively modern um, mechanization happened. As uh, Madam Doctor mentioned, the profitability or rationality of the use of this uh, equipment, that's a different story. Uh, the need actually and willingness to be the owner of a tractor uh, means a certain promotion to the modern and contemporary farming, uh, no matter whether the tractor was needed or not. Um, the second aspect, which is related to uh, the modernization, something that I mentioned already, the uh, appearing professionalization. So the peasant uh, countryside in some areas like Wielkopolska or Pomerania, the area of Gdańsk, uh, Warmia and uh, Lake District, Podlasie. So um, just, you know, this scattered individual uh, regions, that was not a homogenic process, but uh, we had farm holdings that actually were transformed into the agricultural holdings. Uh, there was a research carried out in the 1980s, and uh, the rural population was asked whether they are actually farmers or peasants. Uh, already then, majority of them felt uh, uh, farmers, uh, the producers of food. So the question of education is, of course, uh, uh, an, an issue related to the modernization, no matter how actually open the education system uh, was, uh, whether the uh, countryside children were interested in education or not, that's a different story, but actually modernization measured by a level of education had happened as well. I think we can talk about modernization and the uh, context of uh, institutionalization. Uh, you, the professor, mentioned social insurance and the farmers' pensions. Uh, I think many people don't actually are, isn't, are not aware that until the 80s, the uh, peasants had to and farmers had to pay for the uh, healthcare services, uh, uh, hospitalization, etc. So the farmers had to be insured to be able to enjoy these services. We can make a joke that if the social health insurance was introduced back then, uh, the 
the whole community there would have got the actually the topic. They had to actually got insured uh, if they wanted to enjoy the healthcare services. Pension system in the countryside. Definitely, it was a huge and very important, crucial progress. Uh, the mm, phenomenon of pension um, retirement uh, pension actually introduced a certain independence of the elderly population. It was a marginal actually pension. Uh, did not allow the, uh, to survive, uh, but it gave a certain financial autonomy to the elderly population. And it uh, started the process of actually initiated the process of uh, passing the land over to the successors. Because in the past, uh, it was somehow limited. It changed the relationship between senior and population and young people. They started to be of a partnership nature and not patriarchal nature anymore where the father is ahead deciding about everything. So all these uh, changes in the area of farm holding happened over time and they could uh, be classified as the um, kind of modern changes uh, as I uh, contemporary changes. And let me stress also um, the fact that the uh, Polish People's Republic and the whole countryside situation created some anti-modernization, anti-contemporary attitudes and behaviors, uh, something that we have mentioned, something um, related to the insufficiency of uh, various uh, services and goods, so clientelism. Um, well, definitely, um, this was not referring to the modern institutions. Uh, that was rather uh, something that burdened the situation in Poland, uh, Polish countryside in the 90s. So coming to an end, let me quote actually some sociological uh, analysis, psychological analysis, uh, uh, so something at the brink of sociology and psychology, whether the uh, authorities were actually pro the country, whether the uh, authorities led the politics uh, supporting the countryside. But I think this was uh, quite opposite. This, this, this was actually the politics that depreciated the uh, heritage of the countryside, countryside culture, um, behaviors, etc., um, habits, so customs. So um, it was believed that the country was superstitious and this image somehow survived in the uh, perception of countryside as the backwarded, uh, uh, not modern, not reluctant uh, um, to the um, modernity, etc., etc. So the studies uh, carried out by Professor Barelska um, unanimously proved this aspects indicated these aspects and uh, quite durable aspects uh, and the uh, uh, Polish People's Republic was uh, supposed actually to bring the change in the countryside countryside was supposed of course to become more urban through just you know go moving away from tradition culture customs etc so the Polish countryside was supposed to get modern by negation of the uh, country heritage. So shifting towards modernity meant actually the um, drop of the cultural heritage. So that's all about the uh, attitude of the authorities towards the countryside and how the authorities actually perceived the question of uh, modernity, modernization of countryside from the cultural mentality um, perspective.
Thank you, Madam Professor. Uh, uh, where is um, Dr. Sylvia Stasha? Just one uh, sentence referring to modernization of the buildings in the countryside, the housing system. So um, there was no modernization from the state because well, the uh, housing sector uh, in the 1980s, uh, the 1987, over 50% of housing uh, um, systems in the countryside were equipped and connected to the, to the water systems. The majority of these housing systems did not have even access to the toilets, and which made the uh, countryside children actually um, less... Uh, valuable, so to say. 60% of the bathrooms did not have the central heating systems. The gas was not supplied to more than 90% of the householding. So these are this is data from 1986. So I believe this modernization. Um, uh, was referring also to the quality of life and comfort of life in the country. So I just wanted to mention it in my intervention, I forgot about it. At bottom, can I just say one sentence? Yes, I do agree. Modernization is a multidimensional aspect. So uh, we, it encompasses uh, many aspects. Of course, infrastructure was horrible. Uh, the uh, gas supply does not exist even nowadays. The sewage systems, the wastewater system actually a little bit better, uh, but these are investments from the times of the European Union after the accession. So bear in mind, it happened quite recently. However, during the uh, Polish Republic times, the electrification of uh, the country happened. So uh, on the other hand, we had some rural houses holdings uh, that uh, were uh, first receiving the washing machines, for instance. So, we cannot say that. We can make this absolute statement saying, no, uh, it was bad or good, uh, it was modernized or not. Uh, we are not entitled, actually, to make this sentence. Madam Professor, I fully agree. I fully agree with you. So let me refer to one of the last sentences by Madame Leszczyńska, saying that modernization was actually a drop of bonds and links uh, with the past. Uh, um, I think actually to all these mentioned plots, the topics, uh, one more thing. Uh, after 1944, what was actually the meaning for all these mental changes, modernization, transformation, etc. After 1944 and 45, uh, the rural population lost their neighbors, like minor, ethnic uh, minorities and Jews, and uh, they didn't it impact somehow the changes and the attitudes because actually these populations actually interfered with the rural population of the Polish countryside before 1939. Uh, over to Professor Tomasz Osiński. You're muted, sir. I'm back. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe I'll start uh, uh, not with what uh, was discussed at the end. I would like to pay attention, well, maybe because of the fact that this, this, these periods are the ones that have researched more. So I would like to pay attention to the moment of start, but because when we talk about modernization, we should remember about what we are starting with. We are not starting with what was 
happening in 1939. We have the period of the war, extensive uh, uh, destruction. Uh, by the way, I uh, found some reports uh, from the secret police about a village in Kowalski County that was the direct uh, front line. And the uh, uh, Red Army stayed uh, since August 44 to January 45. And the harvest is happening without the participation of the local inhabitants. And this area, this uh, territory is actually raised to the ground. Uh, so the buildings for the needs of the uh, army are dismantled and the Red Army soldiers uh, use whatever was not uh, destroyed, whatever they didn't destroy themselves. Uh, they just use it. So this is a situation that we are dealing with, not only in this region. The second thing that I wanted to mention, uh, and so far as uh, as the topic of, of the mentions of the states, uh, gentry states, the situation is as follows. Besides the division of lands, there is also the issue of the machine park of the landowners, which in reality in the part is uh, inherited by, by the beneficiaries, but uh, to a certain degree is not uh, uh, fit to be used in individual farms, uh, peasant farms. So it's being used in uh, the created uh, machine institutions. I analyzed some materials about one powiat in Lubelskie uh, about uh, uh, the uh, acquisition uh, or equipping the beneficiaries of the reform in equipment. So it turns out that they have just the basic ones, basic uh, uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, I don't know, sometimes there are shovels and buckets and whatever. But uh, what's interesting, or plow, uh, but sometimes uh, equipment like that is divided or shared among uh, four or several new owners. Well, there is no livestock, so uh, these people immediately have a very difficult uh, starting moment. Uh, uh, we've been speaking, well, I, I was speaking about the fact that uh, the, the countryside uh, is in a way uh, with, with, with so socialized, uh, let's say, uh, agriculture and individual farming. We have a lot of burdens insofar as individual farmers practically, pretty much making it impossible to develop because there are legal limitations. Professor Leszczyńska was speaking about the investment process, so about those possibilities that uh, are not at the disposal of individual farmers. And we also have the problem of succession, which we can treat in various ways. Uh, we can uh, relate it to the fact why rural children, children and the villages and education at a certain level. We can also uh, tackle the social security for the elderly. So in my opinion, the situation is quite difficult and uh, actually I don't know what's the scale. This is quite an interesting phenomenon. I don't know if this is analyzed. How many people give up on that? They for sure managed in this situation. Well, not all had uh, adequate preparation. Some have determination, others didn't. So, Maybe there were many various factors. So some of these people were, were an easy trophy for the cooperatives, production cooperatives are potentially as a, a people who would employ themselves in state estates or migrating to the West, etc., etc. So I would pay attention to the starting moment uh, 
jak ta wieś wygląda powoli? In so far as what this village, this countryside looks like after the war, besides the fact that there are a lot of losses in so far as buildings, a lot of destruction and many other aspects. What's interesting is the problem of how these people manage insofar as new farmers because they don't have any buildings, they don't have houses, so they live in in, in, in some dwellings that are appointed to them, uh, like replacement flats. And another thing that I was thinking about, wondering about this, this thing that, that, that in this context that I'm the last one to take the floor, so in a way I have a smaller uh, area for maneuver. Uh, I would like to mention what Mr. Professor has mentioned these educational issues, but I would like to treat them more broadly. I would like to say, I would like to tell you about something which could be called the modernization of uh, rural space. Uh, I'm going to explain what I mean. Actually, in the, this rural space, we cannot say that education library is something that never existed. Of course, the scale matters, and I agree with that. But under Polish People's Republic, this is changing, in my opinion, in such a sense that the scope of various uh, types of services is growing. Services that uh, uh, the inhabitants of the villages have access, like the reading groups, uh, various clubs, uh, culture institutions, uh, places for meetings where, where, where life goes on, uh, life for uh, social life for the youth uh, and for, for organizations. There was also at a certain moment uh, uh, a, a talk of uh, rural sports, because this is uh, the period of the Polish People's Republic. So the idea of popularizing sports, uh, creating athletic uh, clubs uh, in the rural areas with various offer because, of, of course, it depends uh, on many things. So we remember that well, I, I would like to tackle this this this, uh, this subject in the next uh, point uh, of my discussion that we have some remnants of industry in the countryside so there are such towns where uh, besides the agrarian sector we can also find other employment so also, healthcare reaches the countryside in various formulas because we know that there are some people who don't have any rights to deal with that, and they're at the various levels of education. It does exist in in this uh, period. Uh, I would like to relate to what the professor said previously, that there is this tendency insofar as education, uh, they want children to become independent as quickly as possible. So if we look at the later years, uh, 70s and 80s, we could say that sometimes uh, the the schools or schooling or school as a building or as this possibility for the children to be learning without uh, uh, commuting or going somewhere far to the school appears in many very small um, areas because there are school branches with uh, education on the elementary level and we have 
the stress hole, so the end of elementary education. And now the issue, of course, of employment or the issue of further education in the city. And I'm moving to the next theme, next subject. So there is this transmission belt between, or conveyor belt between the village and the city, education. The contact is, I have just jotted it down, that during this period we can say that the contact with the city for those who don't like to move away of their village is in three basic elements. If you are, of course, a man, doctor, school, and military. And I'm going to interrupt here. OK, let's move to the next theme. And I'm going to give you five minutes each, exactly, because time is really flying. This is a rural community, but there is the city in all of that. So a short question. A man, a peasant in the city, is he an intruder or a host? Does he become a host out of an intruder? What does it look like from the perspective of various decades of post People's Republic? And I'm going to add to that yet another element. Peasant in the city, a man peasant and a female peasant in the city. Five minutes each, please, Professor. Professor, closer to the microphone because we can't hear you. I'm not going to speak for a long time. Insofar as the peasant in the city, I asked myself such a question. How peasants feel in the city, those who come? There are two groups. On one hand, uh, this is a group of workers, peasants, uh, uh, and someone wanted to talk about it more. This is a group extremely important for me because uh, it, it it brings in the modernization processes to the Polish uh, countryside. It brings uh, uh, the urban culture to the countryside. And the second group are the peasant children who um, uh, experience uh, social advancement uh, when moving to the city. And another issue is how much they'll be able to maintain themselves in the city, find employment, find uh, dwelling. But just moving from the 40s from the village to the city in the 40s or the 50s what a social advancement. And I think it was mass advancement, especially in the early years uh, of Stalinist. Afterwards, there was a big group of uh, peasants' children who moved to the city under Gerek, so in the 80s. So these were two different, completely different worlds. And it seems to me that these people undergo a process of stigmatization in the city. I tried to deal with that some time ago. What is it about? Many elements of their everyday life is perceived in a negative way by the urban dwellers. It starts with the name itself. Very often in production plan in Warsaw, the people who came from the countryside and worked in a city were called Okrungla. Okay. Why? So like round people, because they look good or, or, or I know, chubby. Uh, so they were working to, uh, I don't know, buy a motorcycle. So it was easier to break them. They were more conformist at work. This was very well researched, actually. The third thing, these people spoke differently. They didn't speak in a jargon anymore, but they didn't speak in this literature language. This was a mixture of words coming from the press mixed with the jargon. The social linguists at the end of the 50s described that phenomenon. And we can also see this entering the city and the differences between the countryside and the city in the dwellings. The dwellings of the people who are coming from the countryside to the city have 
dwellings, they, they, it looked like they, they, they wanted, they looked different from the workers' uh, flats. They wanted to have one room that wouldn't be used on an everyday basis. It was this uh, uh, ceremonial white chamber, like in Raymond's writings. White chamber that was supposed to, it was like, like a, a city living room or salon. Sorry, can't hear. So those who actually moved from the rural, uh, rural areas to the urbans, they actually had more kids. So that was quite evident, actually. Those actually coming from the rural uh, uh, areas, living in the city, they had more kids. And this rural population in the cities, actually, they, um, they were simply bigger families. And they um, actually presented so-called immoral um, feminism uh, so uh, just you know uh, surrounding themselves actually with the family members strengthening their position in the city it was all described in details therefore I'm not going to discuss it in details let me uh, say that it's worth remembering that uh, city intelli intelligentsia comes from uh, the uh, uh, rural areas from the countryside 50% of the workers in Poland actually were coming in the first generation from the countryside. Did they actually change the, um, uh, make the uh, labor force uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, um, rural or um, I, I would rather say actually, I would go for this, this impacted the um, local areas actually at this point significantly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Professor Leszczyńska, and uh, maybe before Madam Sylvia Straszak, who will have to leave us before. Uh, just one sentence, please. When it comes to the country and to the city and these movements between actually, on already when the uh, PZPR party was actually established in 1949, such a doctrine was actually proclaimed that the same uh, city should actually build uh, alliances. Uh, uh, um, alliance with the uh, country. So uh, the authorities did not manage for, well, to, to go for it uh, because the industrialization of the city and uh, favoring the city at the cost of the uh, rural life uh, well, had no positive impact. However, as uh, Professor said, I believe that uh, such cooperation or uh, this uh, phenomenon actually of the dual professionalism actually that appeared or bearing in mind the structure of the farms uh, and uh, well it was quite visible end of 60s uh, the 70s this is actually the uh, urban work uh, that brought major of the impact so 70% uh, of uh, people of smallholders actually also lived in uh, the cities so uh, bringing additional impact, uh, income, sorry. So in the 80s, uh, this uh, proportion has changed. Uh, the uh, problems, new problems actually in the countryside appeared. People gave up on their jobs in the city. The crisis of industry and the crisis of the 80s reforms that actually were trying to rescue the system. Well, all this actually um, happened and until 80, uh, 80s, actually, mid 80s, uh, uh, this percentage of people living in the uh, countryside and working in the city remained in the second half of the 80s, actually, this, this percentage actually decreased uh, significantly. So data from 1980. 83, 70 percent uh, of the popu rural population also worked in the cities, and actually in the 87, it was 53 percent only. So uh, I'm talking about the family holdings and not the state-owned uh, So we have to bear in mind that the city was also the uh, market for se uh, for selling goods produced in the country, and there was such trade actually existing, if there were no goods. I remember myself when visiting actually my 
grandparents uh, by, at the end of the 80s, we were actually going for some kind of trade exchange. Uh, people from the city had uh, friends and family in the country and uh, brought uh, this uh, agri products to the city and the other way around. So this exchange was quite dynamic. It changed. The situation was quite dynamic as well. In the first period of cooperation, so-called, uh, and uh, unfortunately failed. failed. That's what I believe. Okay, doctor, thank you very much. Now over to Professor Cecilia Meszczyńska. Just five minutes. And uh, let me uh, remind the context of a uh, woman. Woman actually uh, goes uh, to the city for education. Uh, the, these are the women actually who became the white colors. Actually, they entered this uh, bureaucratic, let's say, area. Yes. Before Madam Professor starts, actually her intervention let me thank you for, because of some duties uh, family actually duties i have to obligations i have and commitments i had to finish i have to leave you it was my great pleasure to spend uh, this day with you and uh, it was uh, extremely fruitful and valuable time very pleasant meeting however i have to admit this actually convention of this uh, just you know discussion uh, scared me in the first moment but that was really very, uh, very good. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Doctor. Goodbye. Professor, uh, women in the city. The issue of the migration and the potential, potential promotion. I, well, I did not actually analyze this phenomenon, so I don't want to talk too much about it. However, the literature actually, the contemporary literature, uh, take this uh, feminine aspect in a broad perspective, and it indicates that actually all this depends on the timing, time framework. So I would say that migration and uh, finding uh, your place in the city looked completely different in the in the 50s, the first uh, wave of the migration, and in the 70s, because actually in the 70s, uh, the countryside differs from the countryside of the 50s. Uh, in the 50s, the migration uh, basically actually move, uh, goes to the big centers, industrialized uh, uh, centers such as Silesia. Then uh, the 80s, we know there was there were certain limitations of migration and um, lack of uh, housing systems but then uh, the situation has changed because the countryside actually has changed so the countryside of 40s and 50s this is actually the interwar uh, actually uh, countryside in terms of certain patterns behaviors and customs and then in the 60s the countryside actually started to look completely different. So finding your place in the city, well, it's no city is no longer that distant. Uh, it was actually somehow, um, it was made um, more friendly in the previous decades. But these migrations was uh, following a certain cascade model. So from the countryside to the uh, little bit uh, bigger village, village to the town, town to the city, etc. So let me quote some numbers. The natural increase of population in the 70s uh, amounted to 2 million people. 1.5 million people left actually countryside. So in fact, 500,000 people stayed in the country. As look at the scale of this phenomenon. In the 70s, uh, the uh, growth of population, 1.5, uh, 1.7 million people. Mm. Uh, so the countryside actually started to reduce because throughout the whole Polish, Republic, Polish People's Republic, actually, times, uh, uh, it, only in the 70s, actually, the migration uh, was uh, limited. So the migration scale, actually, before was very, uh, was very big. And then, uh, 
and in the 80s, actually, 300,000 people, uh, the natural increase in population, uh, the increase in population, however, the true increase was minus 300,000 because majority of people left the countryside and they migrated to the cities. So this uh, problem of actually um, finding your place in the city is actually, it differs a lot. Of course, we have to approach it from, from various perspectives depending on the um, time that it happened. And uh, let me draw attention to yet another thing, uh, the specific uh, professional group, peasant uh, blue collars actually, who actually moved city to the uh, countryside, certain customs, habits, innovations uh, in the householdings, uh, and light appliances, new professions like vets, teachers, uh, and directors, etc., etc. So all these actually moved the a certain uh, patterns of behaviors from the city to the uh, uh, countryside. So this is, let's say, a bi-directional uh, exchange. We have a great movie, Konopielka, that was already mentioned. Um, we also have actually another movie that uh, actually uh, described the life uh, in the city and the countryside daleko od szosy, far away from the road. And the uh, question of uh, language, certain mental barriers, uh, uh, limiting actually connections between the rural and urban population. So um, all, well, the, lit the cinematography actually uh, actually demonstrated uh, these times in a proper way. When it comes to um, actually women living in this, moving to the cities, I have not analyzed, honestly speaking, this topic. Uh, of course, women were promoted, but probably there was a problem that at the later stage would be described, namely, the uh, professor mentioned the number of kids, whereas I would uh, raise another topic, the possibility of actually finding actually a life partner. Uh, the, uh, so uh, men stayed in the uh, countryside. Uh, they were not. Uh, they had problems actually to find uh, women uh, wives. Uh, there is a question of this mismatch. Uh, in the city, we have the surplus of. Uh, women vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, headcount of men. So um, that was yet another topic to be mentioned. Uh, Dr. Tomasz Osiński, last five minutes. Proszę Państwa, ja tutaj dokonałem jeszcze takiej rzeczy, chciałbym tu wprowadzić element. I wanted actually to inform you about yet another additional element. Let me start with the following. I believe the countryside actually needed from the city certain things. Employment, first of all. Second of all, the market for selling goods, education and entertainment. So the question is, whether the uh, countryside people need to move to the cities to fulfill their needs. Uh, um, today, nowadays, actually, I've uh, verified the recent statistics. We have 950 cities in Poland, only 37 uh, above 100,000 uh, people. The vast majority, uh, these are the cities uh, with the population smaller than 5,000 inhabitants. So, um, of course, many of these centers uh, have been um, functioning in the po uh, Polish Republic times, and they actually fulfilled certain uh, urban functions, and they fulfilled and satisfied certain needs of the rural population. I personally actually come from a small village that actually was located uh, in a Huta Stalowa Wola. So I uh, uh, have the industrialized area. As uh, Dr. Straszak actually uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, buses uh, um, bringing uh, employees uh, distant, actually, uh, remote, actually, to distant remote places of employment. Uh, so, uh, to a certain extent, I'm interested in the 
jak wiele osób odrzuciło tą pokusę tak, przeprowadzenia tego people wniosku, actually rejected this uh, attempt to zatrudnienia się poza miastem, które to to też mogło być postrzegane jako to, to miejsce wiecznego niedoboru, szczególnie w tym, um, w tym to leave countryside, uh, uh, you know, the place that was perceived as the uh, place of the permanent actually uh, insufficiencies uh, in terms of, let's say, basic products and goods. I found quite interesting uh, information that may uh, refer to the uh, number of smaller uh, But villages, uh, something between the countryside and the city. So the party authorities, they were trying, they were actually um, trying to verify how to increase the employment in these uh, locations. For instance, they were applying, uh, they were trying to build uh, the um, branch offices of big uh, industrial plants uh, uh, just to bring actually the bigger cities to the countryside. A propos migracji. Dobrze. A propos migracji. No one są czasami w bardzo konkretnych sposób wyłane, bo decyzja o dużych inwestycjach provoked in a quite specific way because the decision about big uh, investments results in the fact that in the different parts of Poland there are uh, workers uh, dwelling estates that are supposed to become a magnet for the rural population. Well, this relationship between the city and the countryside is eternal and every single one of us has some kind of relationship with the other place. Just an anecdote, my wife accidentally uh, met one of her uh, students uh, Uh, who asked her at the, at the hall, saying, oh, you have the village in, and that there was the name of the village. So everyone has a village, someone, their own village. So not prolonging, uh, I just want to end with that. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for this fantastic discussion, fantastic meeting. I'm very happy, not only because of this uh, fact, uh, uh, although it was the most important that this discussion was so colorful that uh, you could <laughs> find uh, 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 time to, to, to have this discussion <laughs> with us. But uh, also, um, it's great that we were able to meet during these difficult times, and I give the floor to uh, Professor Hust, uh, host of the, the chairperson of our meeting. I would like to thank you for the participation in today's conference. After the second panel, it seemed to me that the majority of matters were discussed. Uh, the village, the situation of the peasants policy of the communist state, but your discussion actually proved me wrong. You have discovered new aspects, new planes, new, new areas worth discussing in every single one of the dimensions, political and social and cultural. So thank you very much. I'm very happy that this conference came to fruition and I'm very happy that it's being recorded because we have uh, uh, paradoxically realized, thanks to the epidemics of COVID-19, 2019, that hundreds or thousands of people watch, listen to our intervention but uh, on the condition that uh, it is visible online. And it is uh, actually recorded from the beginning to the end, and your interventions will also be uh, uh, placed online. And I'm very happy because these were very interesting discussions. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And tomorrow we'll meet again from 9 to 11, the fourth round of the conference. This is going to be only about the resistance, about the political activities in the countryside in Poland in the years, well, actually the entire post-war period to Polish People's Republic, especially in the 70s and 80s. Thank you for your attention and see you.